Good morning and welcome to day 27 for financial accounting for the fall 2021 semester. On Tuesday, we started chapter 13 on the cash flow statement after we finished up that little bit we carried over for chapter 12. And so if things go well today, we should be finishing up chapter 13 today. If not, we will simply carry over any remaining. We'll take a look at that at the end of class. But hopefully we'll finish up chapter 13 and be right on track. Next week, our final two classes for new material, we'll cover chapter 14. And you all know we've talked about it a couple times already. So once we finish chapter 14, which will be next Thursday the 9th, you're welcome to go ahead and finish up the remaining assignments, the 14 problems, and then the final not final, the last exam and the last piece of the project. As I said on Wednesday, excuse me, Tuesday, we started chapter 13 on the cash flow statement. We talked about the structure of the cash flow statement, the division of those three um, parts, the operating activity section, which is the stuff that we do on a day to day business, uh, running the business, the Investing section is second, and that is buying and selling of plant assets and buying and selling of financial instruments like stocks and bonds. And then um, the final of the main, the body of the, the statement is the financing activities, which would be anything related to buying and selling our own stock or paying dividends on that stock. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and also borrowing money by issuing bonds, by taking out loans from a lending institution, such as a mortgage or notes payable. The only piece that is treated differently is the paying of the interest on those borrowings because the interest is already included on the income statement and um, that would um, be considered then an operating activity. We did a couple exercises together in class on Tuesday. And we're going to start today with a review. So one more opportunity to complete the, cap, the operating section of the cash flow statement in, chat, in exercise nine. Any questions before we just get started with our work for today? So I will remind you that in the reference materials folder for chapter 13, we have the guidance for calculating operating cash flows. That's what we'll be using to do our first exercise today, exercise nine. Once we do that review to get us back going for today, we will look at separately the investing information, the financing information, and then when we end class with exercise 10, we will be doing a complete cash flow statement. So this is the first time, the only time together we'll be doing the full cash flow statement. So just looking at exercise 10, then you can see the format that I was just describing. As always, we have a three line heading on a financial statement. The cash flow statement, as we said on Tuesday, covers a range of dates, so it must specify what that range is for the year, the month, the day, the quarter, the week, whatever. And then we've got the three sections, the operating, the investing, the financing section. Then we reconcile the change in our cash to what the balance sheet showed. And as we saw on Tuesday, if the company had any non-cash investing and financing transactions, those could be disclosed at the bottom of the cash flow statement on a separate schedule. And I've just tacked on the bottom. As we discussed on Tuesday, it's related because it's investing and financing, even though no cash may have changed hands yet. Gap says you have to tell people you did those things. And so as a matter of practice, many companies choose to show that on their cash flow statement, even though it's not technically um, a cash flow. 
So let's go to exercise nine. And again, I would encourage you to use or refer to the guidance page in Blackboard if you find that helpful. You may even want to print that out. Probably showed you earlier in the semester how to print something from Blackboard, but you just want to left click, hold and drag to highlight that and then choose the print option. If you pull in too much, sometimes it makes it a little squishy. So you wanna always preview and make sure it looks like what you want it to look like that it's all fitting on one page. No, so thanks JP. We are going to, we're doing exercise nine just to get started and then we're gonna go back and start with exercise four go to exercise four right after exercise nine. So no, not that none of those um, were already done. Okay, so let's see what we have in exercise nine. So this is just a, another chance to practice with what we did last time. Selected data in thousands derived from the income statement and balance sheet of National Beverage Corp for a recent year are as follows. We have some information from the income statement, information from the balance sheet. As we have mentioned um, already earlier in this chapter, the reason that we really don't spend much time at all talking about the cash flow statement until we get to chapter 13 and we're really wrapping up the financial accounting part of the chapter for the course is that the cash flow statement uses information from all three of the earlier financial statements. The operating section, as you can see, is going to use the income statement and the balance sheet. And then in the investing and financing section, we may be also looking at the, at the statement of stockholders equity. So for this exercise, we're doing just the operating activity section. As you know, we all, for this class, we are always going to be using what's known as the indirect method. So rather than saying in the operating section, we spent money on paying salaries to our workers and here's how much we spent. We spent money on interest and here's how much we spent. Instead, we start with the net income, which we already know from the income statement. And then we simply reconcile that to take, make any adjustments needed because we don't use the, um, the cash method of accounting. Instead, we use the accrual method. We're required to use the accrual method for GAAP. And so it is less, it's not as easy to understand when we look at it. It's not as easy to see where did our money go, but it is easier for us to use the indirect method simply because that's how our accounting systems are set up. So as I said on Tuesday, about 95% of large companies use the indirect method and that's why it's the only method we are using because it's the one that you're going to see when you, when you look at your company that you chose for the project or when you in the real world are looking at a cash flow statement, you're almost certain to see the indirect method. So we always start with net income, which is given here as $49,311. Keep in mind that net income could be a net loss, which would mean a negative number to start out. We then have our adjustments. And as we discussed on Tuesday, the first set of adjustments are from the income statement, and then we have adjustments or reconciling items from the balance sheet. How to go about this is listed here in the operating cash flows guidance that I have for you in Blackboard. The income statement part is number three, and then the balance sheet part is number four. From the income statement, we are looking specifically for two different types of adjusting items. If we have any non-cash expenses, depreciation, depletion, amortization, all three of those concepts that we covered in chapter nine, those are non-cash expenses that show up on the income statement. They reduced our income, but we didn't spend any cash. We didn't use any cash for them. And so since they've already been subtracted from our income, we need to add those back. 
$11,580 that we recorded as depreciation expense is related to some property, plant, and equipment, long-term tangible assets that we paid for 5, 10, 20, however many years ago we bought that. There was no cash expended to acquire those assets this period. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. It reduced our income. We need to add it back. What else do we have here? Other items involving non-cash expenses. So those There we go. So it does not matter in which order we write those adjustments. I just had to find where it was given in the in that drop down box list of items. So the other items involving non cash expenses, again, reduced our income, but did not affect our cash. So we need to add that back. So that's the first type of adjustment. Non-cash expenses need to be added back. They've reduced income, they need to be added back to our cash. On the income statement, the other type of adjustment are gains and losses related to investing activity. Gains and losses as we sell long-term assets or financial instruments. And so in this exercise, we are given gain on disposal of property. So let's think about what happened. We sold some piece of property, some maybe it was equipment or whatever. We sold it for more than its book value, more than its carrying value. And so when that happened, we recorded the sale. We removed that property, whatever it was, from our balance sheet along with the accumulated depreciation on that property. We recorded the receipt of cash for the full amount that we received when we sold it. And that gain was recorded on the income statement somewhat like a revenue in that it has a credit balance and it increases our income. But selling property is not an operating activity sell, unless we are a real estate company. Selling property is something that we do on the side as an investing activity. So. Could be we bought some new property to replace it. When we sold this property, that gain increased our income, but it's not related to operating activities. So we need to get it out of the operating section of the cash flow statement. So we're going to subtract that gain. It's already included in this net income as it should have been. I'm not suggesting it was wrong on the income statement. All I'm saying is it's not an operating activity. And so we need it out of the operating activity section on the cash flow statement. For this company, if we were doing their full cash flow statement, when we get to the investing section, we would deal with selling that property. We would report the cash that we realized from selling that property. And as I suggested on in Blackboard, it's explained here what we do with them. Add back any losses or subtract any gains, and that's what we just did. We just subtracted out the gain. It doesn't belong in the operating activity section. Everybody okay so far? So we covered... Um, Unlike what we did in exercise three at the end of class last time, where we had just, I think, one adjusting item from the income statement, which was depreciation, you can see now in this exercise, we could have multiple. We could have depreciation and depletion and amortization and some gains and some losses. We could have a bunch of items there. And so this is maybe more realistic in that it allows us to see multiple adjustments coming from the income statement. The next part then of the operating section is the adjustments that come from the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, we're looking at our current assets and current liabilities, also known as the operating accounts. And we're looking to see how did they change? As you saw on Tuesday, we have in Blackboard the four different possible changes. A current asset could increase or decrease. A current liability could increase or decrease. 
And this information tells you exactly what to do with that. So we have an increase in accounts receivable. Increase in accounts receivable. The increase was $1,746. You can just look at these, this guidance and say increase in a current asset, show this as a negative. That's fine. You can do it that way. As I said on Tuesday, even if you have no idea why we do that, you can still correctly put together your cash flow statement. What I would prefer is that you look at that and say, hmm, increase in accounts receivable. Why would that be? Well, what happened? We reported the revenue, but our customer hasn't paid us yet. The revenue is included in our income, but we don't yet have the cash. That revenue is included in this net income, but we don't have the cash. And so we need to subtract that out because what we're talking about here is cash, not income. I would prefer that you can kind of logic through it like that, but if it doesn't make sense or doesn't make sense yet, you still have the tools you need to be successful at this because it tells you exactly what to do, whether to show it as a negative or a positive. Our next item is a decrease in inventory. Again, you can go to the rules and see what to do, or you can think it through. What, what would happen if we have a decrease in inventory? That means we sold some stuff that we didn't replace. So we reported the expense as cost of goods sold, but we didn't spend the cash on it. A decrease in a current asset, looking at the rules, a decrease in a current asset means that our cash is higher than we would expect it to be based on our income statement. We need to add that back. Increase in prepaid expenses. How do we get an in, a prepaid expense to increase? Well, we bought something else that we haven't reported yet as an expense. We used cash to buy that, whether it's an insurance policy or pay our rent in advance or whatever. Decrease in accounts payable. So now we're going over to the liability side of the balance sheet. How do you get an accounts payable to go down? Well, you paid it off, you paid for it, you used cash. So a decrease in accounts payable uses cash that does not show up on our income statement. And the same thing for the decrease in accrued and other current liabilities. The way you get a liability to go down is to pay for it. And to finish up the cash flow statement, and then we just have a couple questions to answer about it. To finish up the cash flow statement, I'm just going to add down that column, starting from the net income. Add down that column. This is why it is critical that you have the negatives and positives in the right place on the cash flow statement, like on the statement of stockholders equity but different from what we've said for the balance sheet and the income statement. Hopefully I added those correctly. So different from what we said for the income statement and the balance sheet, but similar to what we said for the statement of stockholders equity, it is wrong to leave out the negatives. On the balance sheet, for example, for the accumulated depreciation, I have said, you can put the negative if it helps you to remember to subtract. It's not wrong not to have the negative. Everyone knows that you have to subtract the accumulated depreciation. On the income statement, I said you can make the expenses negative if it helps you remember to subtract, but it's not wrong to show them as a positive. On the cash flow statement, like on the statement of stockholders equity, it is wrong if you leave off the negative. Our exercises always remind us to use the minus sign. I don't know 100% for sure that that's true on an exam question. So it is important that you know where the negatives and positives belong. It also makes it so we can simply 
add up this column without having to stop and think, wait, is that a subtraction or an addition? So what do we see here? Before we look at the questions we have to answer, what do we see here on the cash flow statement? Well, their net income was 49,311, and their net cash flows from operating activities was more than that, 58,020. Um, we're going to spend most of chapter 14 talking about how do we analyze financial statements? What kind of calculations can we do to see how is this company doing in a variety of areas, including liquidity and profitability and market strength and long-term solvency? and cash flow adequacy. When we analyze the, in the cash flow statement, as I told you on Tuesday, this number, net cash flows from operating activities is the single most important number. That number starts all of our calculations related to the cash flow statement. We want, ideally, we want this net cash flows from operating activities to be larger than net income. We do a ratio of those two, net cash flow from operating activities to net income, and we're looking for a ratio greater than one. This company is doing pretty well in terms of generating cash because their net cash flows from operating activities are greater than their net income. Let me remind you though, this net income could be a net loss. As you can see, many of our, our adjusting items here are negative. It happens that it, the total of all of those could be negative. And so our net cash flows from operating activities could also be negative. If our net cash flows from operating activities are negative, the company's not doing very well. And if they are, if that is negative, any of the calculations we mother otherwise might do are meaningless. Okay. It doesn't make sense, and, and this is a math question. If our net cash flow from operating activities was negative and our net income was negative, if you divide a negative by a negative, you get a positive. If our net cash flows from operating activities was more negative than net income, we'd end up with a positive value greater than one, which I just told you is what you're going for. But do we really think that that is, is that a good thing if the company has negative net cash flows from operating activities and it's larger than their net loss? I think it's pretty clear to stop and think about it. No, that's not a good situation. I'm suggesting that you don't do those calculations at all if the net cash flows from operating activities are negative. The other calculations are meaningless and may even be misleading, may even give someone a false impression about the company. The company has positive earnings, $49,311, and positive net cash flow from operating activities. I've just spent the last minute or two explaining why the, either one or both of those numbers could be negative. The increase in accounts receivable indicates an increase in sales. Likely the reason that they're owed more by their customers now is because they sold more this period and the customers just haven't paid for it yet. In addition, the company is using its cash to decrease its accounts payable balance, which indicates that the company is generating enough cash from operations. No, that's not right. Okay, I, of the two, two options they give us, that, that's the better one. The, the first answer, falling behind in its payments to vendors, that's clearly not the case. If their accounts payable is going down, they're paying off their liabilities. I don't know why, why this is their other option. From a cash flow management standpoint, it doesn't make sense to pay for your inventory in cash. If you have the option of, of having a delay of holding on to your own cash longer, that's, a, that's good cash management. So I'm, I, 
of the two answers, that's the better of the two. It's the only one that possibly makes sense. I guess you could say they are generating enough cash that they could pay for its inventory in cash. I just don't know why you would do that. If somebody's going to let you wait a couple weeks to pay and not have to pay interest on it, that's the other criteria here. Why would you pay any earlier than you need to? But I didn't write the question. We have to go with the options that they give us. So that's the better of the two. The other one's clearly not true. Overall, national beverage is doing well financially in terms of their cash generating efficiency, their ability to generate cash from their operating activities. That's what we're looking at here. So that's our review of what we had done last class. As I said, the operating activity section of the cash flow statement is the most important. It's certainly the longest. If we look at an actual cash flow statement, if you look at the cash flow statement for your company that you chose for the project, you will almost certainly see that the operating activity section is about half of the cash flow statement, maybe even more than that. Any questions before we go back to exercise four? Why was the increase in prepaid expenses nine years ago? Oh, and I see JP just put that in the chat as well. Why are the prepaid expenses negative? Okay, so where is that here? Increase in prepaid expenses. So I'll give you two explanations. The first one's a simple one. Because if we look over here in Blackboard, it says an increase in a current asset is shown as a negative. But here's the, the real explanation for why, why that works. Well, what it, what's an example of a prepaid expense that we've been talking about since chapter one or two? Prepaid rent, prepaid insurance. So how would you get a prepaid rent account to increase? It's because you paid some more rent, right? paying that rent would use cash. And that's why we show it as a negative because it, we used cash, but we haven't yet recorded the rent expense. We recorded it as an asset. And so we used cash, but it didn't affect our income statement yet. Now next period, if we don't pay any more toward our rent and we simply record the rent expense and reduce that asset, the opposite is going to happen. We're going, we're going to record the expense, but not use the cash. And so then that a decrease in that current asset would mean our cash is higher than income makes us think it would be. Does that make sense? And JP posted the question in the chat. Does that make sense? So there's the, here's how we know because it's one of our rules, but from a practical standpoint, um, increasing that prepaid expense decreases our cash because we had to buy that insurance policy or we had to pay something for our rent that we haven't yet recorded as an expense. A prepaid expense is a current asset because we have purchased something, we paid for something, whether it's that insurance policy or our rent, that's going to benefit more than one period. So our insurance policy might cover us for six months. We need to take that insurance policy cost and allocate it or divide it up across the six months that it benefits. Otherwise, if we reported the whole thing as expense at the time we paid for it, we'd look really bad that month because we've got six months worth of expense in one month. And then the next five months, we'd look better than we really were because we weren't recording any more of that expense. The same thing, of course, would be true for rent. If we pay a, you know, an annual rent all at once because maybe it's cheaper that way or maybe that's what our, what our landlord requires of us, if we report all of that rent in just one month, that month looks really bad and the other months look better than they should. So it's an asset because it's going to benefit more than one period. It's a current asset because it's going to benefit, um, all of the benefits going to be used in one year or less, but it's still more than one month, which is how we normally break up our accounting record. Now, for a situation- JP, does that make sense?
Go ahead, Drew. For a situation like this, um, where it's increasing prepaid expenses, uh -huh. would that be like, like you said, for the six months of insurance? So that be during the first six months that we have already prepaid, we then pay for like the next six months to finish out the year. So this, what we're doing here in this section is looking at the changes in those accounts. Mm -hmm. So if our, let's just take as an example, the accounts receivable. If our accounts receivable stayed exactly the same, does that mean we didn't sell anything? No, it means that our customers paid everything we, equivalent to everything we sold, everything we recorded as sales. Now, does that mean that if, if our accounts receivable was $1,000 at the beginning of the period and $1,000 at the end of the period, is that likely the same $1,000? Hope not. We hope that the $1,000 was owed at the beginning has now been paid off, but customers have charged another $1,000. The same thing is true for our prepaid expenses, that we're just looking at how did it change. It doesn't mean it, it was zero and now it's 605. It could have been 45,000 and now it's 45,605. So yes, you're likely to see changes, increases and decreases across time. If we pay our rent all at once, then it increases at the beginning of the year and then it's going to decrease each month after that. And so what we're counting for here is just the changes in those accounts that are different, that make them different than what we put on our income statement as expense, or in the case of accounts receivable as revenues. Does that answer your question? So it doesn't matter what the state of the prepaid expense is prior to whatever we add to it. We just, for this purpose, we just care about what not we're just looking at how it changed. Yeah, okay. yeah. We are only looking at how it changed. So, so for this exercise, we're given what the change is. If we look at exercise 10 that we're going to do at the end of class today, we're actually given the beginning balance and the ending balance. And so we have to figure out how it changed. And obviously this is a more realistic scenario, right? That you have, here's the balance sheet. Tell me how to use this to create the, the the cash flow statement. So yes, for the cash flow statement, we don't truly don't need to know what the beginning and ending balance was in accounts receivable. As we see here, oops, there we go. As we see here in exercise 10, we didn't, we don't really need to know it was 49 at the beginning and 55 at the end of the year. What we need to know is it increased by six. Any other questions before we, so that's the operating section. And as I said, um, we are going to now move on to the investing and financing sections. We're going to look at individual examples of, of how um, that section, or those sections would be affected. And, and then at the end, we will pull everything together into the full cash flow statement. I think for this exercise, I want to draw this out for you in the T accounts. I don't know why that's red. I'm just going to put some T accounts on the screen here. We just had a momentary fear that I had forgotten to start recording. T accounts on here. I might not need all of those. Office equipment, simulated depreciation on that office equipment, cash, maybe I will use all of them. And then this is loss. Okay. So let's see what happened here. 
As I said, we're moving on to the investing section of the, the balance, or excuse me, the cash flow statement. We know that in the investing section, we're going to capture transactions, events that occurred related to buying and selling of plant assets, physical, tangible, property, plant, and equipment kind of stuff, as well as buying and selling of financial instruments. So maybe we buy some bonds issued by another company or by, the, by a government. Maybe we buy some stock in another company, either as a um, just a, a quick way to earn some cash to use the cash that we have, or maybe we buy a, a larger stake that's, that's an investment in that company to try to maybe solidify a relationship with that company or maybe to buy them out or take a controlling interest or something. All those kinds of transactions would appear in the investing section, which comes right after the operating section. Now, these are transactions that don't occur on a daily basis. Um, it, it is possible that a company could, I guess, go through an entire year and have no investing transactions. That certainly could happen. It's not going to happen in our examples because that would defeat the purpose of the example. But in a real world situation, uh, especially for a smaller established company, it could be that there are no in investing transactions. But that clearly can't be true for an operating activity because that's what we do every day when we run the business. Okay, so let's take a look at what we have here. An analysis of the general ledger accounts indicates that office equipment that had a value, or excuse me, which cost $245,000. So it would have looked like that. We had $245,000 that we originally spent on that office equipment. And during the time that we had used that office equipment, we had accumulated depreciation of 112,500. So that was what was on our balance sheet at the time we sold the equipment. So what was the book value of that equipment? This is review from chapter nine. Book value is, or carrying value, is the original or historical cost, 245,000, minus the accumulated depreciation, 112,500. The book value at the time we sold the equipment was 100, whoops, $132,500. Everyone see where that came from? We sold it for 105,900. So the cash realized from the sale was 105,900. We sold it for less than what our book said it was worth. Does that mean we got a bad deal? Not necessarily, I don't know. Doesn't necessarily mean that. What it means, the only thing we know for sure it means is that during the time that we were using this asset, we didn't record enough depreciation so that our books show that it's more than we can actually get by selling it. So what, what does the transaction look like? Let me change colors here again. What does the transaction look like when we actually sell this asset? We received cash of $105,900. We had to remove the equipment from our books because we don't have it anymore. So we also want to remove the accumulated depreciation that goes along with that. And to make this entry balance, so we have two debits here and one credit and they're not equal, we need another $26,600 on the debit side to make the two parts, the, the debits and credits be equal. So that green entry that I just put in is what we record at the time we sell the equipment. Is there anyone who has a question about what I just did? Because now we have the information we need to be able to answer the questions for this exercise. We needed to think about what really happened and how did we record it. 
So that green entry, all those, the two debits and the two, no, sorry, the three debits and one credit are, is the entry that we would have recorded in our books when we um, sold the equipment. Any questions at this point? Does that make sense? So that's really from chapter nine. So using this information, indicate the items to be reported on the statement of cash flows. Well, the, the $245,000 that we removed from the equipment account is not going to show up at all. That $245,000 we spent on that office equipment happened some number of years ago, probably. At that time, it, if we paid cash for it, it affected our, our cash flow statement as an investing activity, a cash outflow and negative. But now that we're selling it, the $245,000 doesn't really play in. How about the accumulated depreciation? Same thing, we're gonna remove it from our books, but it doesn't affect our cash flow statement. Depreciation has been subtracted a little bit at a time over the entire time we've been using that equipment and at the time, we had added that depreciation back on the cash flow statement, but now that accumulated depreciation is not relevant. How about the sales price? Well, yeah, we showed that right here. It's gonna be in the investing section and it's going to increase our cash. We showed it right here as a debit to cash. We sold the equipment and they paid, whoever bought it, paid us $105,900. Now, how about this loss? So we already know, we, whoops, hard to see in our, in our, uh, with all the writing on the screen, but right here in Blackboard, it tells us what to do with that. Add back any losses. Gains and losses related to investing activities, selling of plant assets, that's exactly what happened. We need to add back the loss. So adding back that loss shows up in the operating activity section. Remember what I just showed you in Blackboard is how we do the operating activity section and it increases. We have to add back that loss. Well, let's think about why that is. The loss is a debit. It looks like an expense. It reduces our net income. But as we already explained, it's not related to operating activities. So we took it out of our income, but we need to add it back because we deal with the cash part of it in the investing section. The gains and losses are not are not related to operating activities. And so we needed to add that loss back. So a lot going on there with the investing activities. Luckily, it doesn't happen all the time. We only have to deal with this on a case by case basis. What we show on the cash flow statement is the actual cash realized from the sale and the investing activity and then dealing with the gains or losses in the operating activity section because they're on the income statement. Now, if we had sold this office equipment at book value, if we had sold it for the 132,500, the impact would be only in the investing section, we would have showed the cash inflow positive of 132,500. And there would be no gain or loss if we sold it for book value. So the accumulated depreciation, uh -huh. any depreciation that occurred during the period would be reflected, but anything prior to that would not. Yeah, good question. So yes, if there was, if this sale did not happen on the very first day or in the first half of the first month of that of this year, there would be new depreciation reported for the partial year that we use that equipment. That would be reflected in 
on the operating section because we have to add back that depreciation. But it would be lumped in with all the other depreciation on all the other office equipment and everything else that we own. Yeah. So, but yeah. Okay. And so as we saw in chapter nine, if the sale of the asset doesn't happen in the first half of the first month, we would have a part year depreciation that would be added to the, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so let's look at exercise five. So as we know, um, buying and selling of plant assets, property, plant, and equipment, that would include any additions to our land. Now land is a little, I don't know, maybe a little easier because there is no depreciation on the land. So we don't have to deal with any accumulated depreciation or depreciation expense related to the land. Exercise five says on the basis of the details of the following fixed asset account, land, indicate the items to be reported on the statement of cash flows. So on March 12th, on March 12th, we bought some land. We paid cash for it. How much cash did we pay? $134,300. Buying that land is an investing activity and buying it is going to reduce our cash. We used cash, $134,300, to buy it. Well, what if we had bought it by issuing a, um, some bonds or bought it by taking out a mortgage, no down payment. We just mortgage the whole thing. Well, that would still be an investing activity because we bought the land. It would also be a financing activity because we issued some debt, whether it's a mortgage or some bonds or something. So it's investing, it's financing, but there's no cash. That type of transaction would be reporting that supplemental schedule at the bottom of the cash flow statement that we've already mentioned. So it is important that they told us here that we purchased it for cash. Now, Let's look at the next line. The next line on October 4th, we sold some land for $106,800. Selling that land yielded $106,800. That is an investing acti activity. Buying the land and selling land is investing activity. Because we sold it and received cash for it, that would increase our cash. We'd show that as a positive in the investing activity section. But look at, look at this. When we sold the land for 106,800, we only removed 89,400 from the land account. We sold it for more than our book said it was worth. Remember, there's no accumulated depreciation to worry about. We sold it for 106, eight. We had only paid 89,400 for it. We, I'm putting this in air quotes, we made $17,400. That $17,400 would appear on our income statement as a gain on the sale of that land. Same rationale that we just went through in the previous exercise going to show up in the operating activity section. That gain increased our net income, but is related to selling the land, related to an investing activity. So we need to deduct it from our income in the operating section. It belonged on the income statement. It was correct, but it's not operating. So we need to make an adjustment for that in the operating section of the cash flow statement. So the question is, how, I, don't, I don't know if on the video, they, I don't think they can see the chat. I'm not positive about that. But so the question in the chat was, how, where did the 17,400 come from? So the cash we realized from the sale was 106,800. But the original cost of the land that we sold, whoops, the land that we sold 
was only 89,400. And I can tell that because that's how much we credited to the land account when we sold that land. We removed the original cost. And so the gain is the difference between what we originally paid for the land and how much we then sold it for. I, I said we made money in, in quotes because yes, it does in, appear on our income statement as a gain and it does increase our income, but we're not in the business of buying and selling land unless we're a real estate company. And so, uh, so selling that land is an investing activity. Yes, it does help us in the long run to sell it for more than we paid for it. And I, I wanna say one other thing. So I just mentioned selling land is not a, a operating activity unless we're a real estate company. If we were a real estate company and we own this land and we're holding it for sale, it would not be listed under our property plant and equipment. It would be listed as one of two things depending on our plan. It would either be listed as inventory. Sounds funny to think of land as, as inventory, but if that's what our job is to sell land, then it's part of our inventory. Or if we were just holding on to the land, not using it in our operations and holding on to it, it could be considered an investment. Any other questions before we keep going? Okay. So those are really the items that we would see in the investing section, buying and selling of property, plant, and equipment. We didn't cover buying and selling of investments financial investments such as stocks or bonds, but the same principles apply. We would show any sales where we receive cash as a positive, a cash inflow. And if we purchased some bonds in another company or some government bonds or something like that, we would show those as a cash outflow. We used cash to do that. Now we're moving on to the financing section. And we know the financing section is going to cover any transactions related to our own stock, whether it's buying back our own stock as treasury stock, that's going to be a cash outflow, selling new stock, that would be a cash inflow or shown as a positive. If we pay dividends on that stock, that would be a cash outflow. Stock dividends would not show up at all because there's no cash impact. The other piece that, and so that's what we're doing in this exercise is transactions related to our stock. So those are financing activities. And in an exercise seven, we'll be looking at some additional um, stockholders equity piece. And then in exercise eight, we'll look at the other type of financing transaction, which are transactions related to our debt. So issuing bonds, paying off the bonds, taking out a mortgage, paying off the mortgage, other than the interest. I've already mentioned that and we'll talk about it again when we get to exercise eight. The board of directors declared cash dividends totaling $1.2 million during the current year. The dividend, sorry, the comparative balance sheet indicates dividends payable of 250,000 at the beginning of the year and 100,000 at the end of the year. So what happened? Our dividends payable went down. Now, I want to point out, dividends payable would be listed under a current liability, but it's not an operating account because it's related to the equity, related to our stock. So when we talk about these adjusting items for the operating section, we talk about operating accounts, dividends payable would not be considered there because it's not related to operations, it's a financing activity. So what does this mean? 
Our dividends payable started out the year at 250 and it ended at 100. How did that happen? How does a dividend or any current liability go down? Because we paid for it, right? We paid off $150,000 of our liability for dividends. We also paid another 1.2 million. So the total we paid was the 1.2 million that were declared this year, plus the 150,000 that we paid off that we already owed. Does that make sense? If not, I can, I can chart it out in UT account to show you what it looks like. Everybody okay? When it says they, that, that they declared cash dividends, yeah. is that, does it mean it's already paid or? Yeah, so let me put it in T account. I think that will be easier. Let me just put a couple of T accounts up here. So we're gonna put dividends. That's the cost of the dividend. And then dividends payable is how much we haven't yet paid of what we declared and then cash. So the dividends payable at the beginning of the year, we were told had a balance of $250,000. So they had already declared dividends at the end of the previous year that they hadn't yet paid. Remember in chapter 12, we talked about the three significant dates. The declaration date, it becomes a liability. We put it on the balance sheet as a payable. Then there's the date of record that determines who's going to receive those dividends. And then a little bit later on is the payment date where we actually pay those dividends. So at the end of last year, we had already declared some dividends that we had not yet paid. During this year, we declared dividends of 1.2 million. At the time we declared those dividends, they become a legal liability of the company. And so we have, we have to put them on the balance sheet as a liability. So throughout the course of the year, we owed our stockholders a total of $1,450,000 worth of dividends. Does that make sense up to this point? But we don't at the end of the year still owe $1,450,000. We are told that at the end of the year, we owe just 100,000. So we owed a total of 1,450,000 during the year. At the end of the year, we only owe 100,000. How much must we have paid off? And this is the, the question. This is what we need to answer. If we owed 1.45 million, and at the end of the year, we owe only 100,000, we must have paid off 1,350,000. That's the only way the math works out to go from 200, owing 250 plus another 1.2 million. And then at the end of the year, we owe only 100,000. So the cash payments, now we can see it in the T accounts, which I'm sure is a much better way of doing that. Now we can see the cash payments must have been 1,350,000. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? So as I have said many times throughout the semester, I, I generally think it's easier to kind of sketch things out in T accounts like this to think about what must have happened there. Okay, let's move on then to our next exercise, more stockholder activity. 
So we know that stockholder transactions are going to be financing, um, financing related. They're, if they affect cash, they show up in the financing activity section. So we'll quickly talk through what must have happened here in, in each of these accounts. And then we're asked on the basis of the following accounts, indicate the items exclusive of net income to be reported on the statement of cash flows. There were no unpaid dividends at the beginning or the end of the year. So what we just did in that previous exercise, we're gonna have to do here. So what happened? We started the year with $4.8 million in stock. A total of 120,000 shares were outstanding. 4.8 million is the par value. And then there was another 360,000 here in the paid in capital in excess of par, the additional paid in capital. On April 2nd, we sold some more stock. 30,000 shares were issued for cash. A total of 1.2 million for the par value, but down here we have another $720,000. So we received $1,920,000 when we sold that stock. So the sale of common stock is going to show up in the financing section. It's going to increase our cash by $1,920,000. That's the par value that shows up in the common stock account plus the excess or additional paid in capital that shows up in the second account we have here. The other transaction that shows up here is a stock dividend. 5% is a small stock dividend. So as we discussed in chapter 12, and I know we talked about this on Tuesday at the beginning of class because of the chapter 12 problem. A small stock dividend doesn't affect our cash, doesn't affect our assets at all, doesn't affect our liabilities. It does not affect the total equity. That small stock dividend means that we reclassify some value from retained earnings into the contributed capital accounts. So if we scroll down here a little bit, you can see right here that that stock dividend had a total value of $450,000, which was split between the additional paid in capital and the par value. All we did was move the $450,000 out of retained earnings, that's the debit to retained earnings, and into the contributed capital. No cash impact at all. It does not affect our statement of cash flows. No cash impact at all. It doesn't affect anything other than the distribution or the split of our equity between contributed capital and retained earnings. That's exactly what, what you're showing in the last part of your chapter 12 problem as well. Okay, so we've talked about everything that happened in the common stock account and the paid in capital account. Now let's look at our retained earnings. We just dealt with the stock dividend. We were told to ignore the net income. Well, why are we ignoring that? Because it, that's an operating activity. That doesn't appear in the financing section at all. The net income would appear in the operating activity section. That's where we would start. So we only have one more line to address and that's this. On December 30th, we paid, or declared and paid maybe. Those couldn't all happen in one day. Um, they're just combining or consolidating those three important dates into one for us for this exercise. We paid a cash dividend. It appears in the financing section and we paid cash. We paid out $315,000 in dividends. So it's going to reduce our cash. We show that as a negative or deduct it from our cash in the financing activity section. Oh, maybe they want me to put a zero in there. Okay. 
Apparently you have to put the zero in there even though it says not applicable. It didn't say to do that, but if you don't put the zero in it doesn't. Where it says item. Under account and human resource. Oh, thank you. Say no, I, the only reason I noticed is because it didn't give me full credit for that exercise, but it says if an amount is not reported enter zero. So you did say it. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? Let's move on to exercise eight then. And exercise eight is the final type of transaction or adjustment we might be recording on the cash flow statement. In the financing section, if we borrow money or pay back the principal, those are financing activities. Once again, the interest is an operating activity. It already shows up on the income statement has already been reduced has already reduced our net income, been subtracted from our income. On the basis of the details of the following bonds payable and related discount accounts, indicate the terms, the items to be reported in the cash flows from financing activities section of the statement of cash flows, assuming no gain or loss on the retiring of the bond. So this is going to allow us to review a little bit from chapter 11 as well. At the beginning of the year, we had some bonds payable. We had some bonds payable. The face value of the bonds was $750,000. I can see that right here, the opening balance in the bonds payable account. But they were issued at a discount. The fact that they were issued at a discount tells us that the interest rate we were paying was less than the market rate of interest at the time we sold the bond. And so in order to get people to buy them, we kind of had to lower the price. During the life of these bonds, then we're amortizing that discount away. That amortization, remember, is a non-cash expense that's reported on the income statement. So the carrying value, I'm just going to call it CB, the carrying value of the bond, the carrying value of these bonds at the beginning of the year was $716,250. So that's the carrying value at the beginning of the year. Yeah, so Sharon just asked in the chat, is there a reason that there aren't more of the show me how features? And I don't know the answer to that. I have no control over whether there's a show me how or not. I always allow them to show if they exist. So I don't know why there isn't one. I don't know. So what happened during the year? We, we know the carrying value of the bonds at the beginning of the year was $716,250. On January 2nd, we retired some bonds. It's helpful that they did that on January 2nd because then we don't have to worry about recording any additional interest or anything else. Everything would have been taken care of at the end of the previous year. But we retired some bonds. By retiring the bonds, it means we bought them back. We could have either called them in if they had a call feature, or we could just buy them on the open market for whatever the prevailing price is. So when we retired those bonds, what happened? The bonds we retired had a face value of 150,000 but had an associated discount of 12,000. So the carrying value of the bonds that we retired was 138,000. And it tells us in the exercise that they were, 
there was no gain or loss. They were retired at their carrying value. Now that's not necessarily likely, but it does make it easier for us to see what we need to see for this exercise. So when we retired these bonds, we paid their carrying value. It's the 150,000 face value minus the $12,000 discount that was still outstanding. When we retire the bonds, that's paying off the bonds. It's a financing activity. We used money, we used cash to do that. And the cash we had to pay was the $138,000 carrying value. Make sense? Okay, so we've addressed the January 2nd entry. Now what happened on June 30th? We issued some new bonds. The new bonds had a face value of 450,000. The face value was 450,000. But you can see here, on June 30th, there was a discount on those bonds of 30,000. So the carrying value at the time the bonds were issued, 420,000. Again, review from chapter 11. We sold them for less than their face value because the interest rate we were paying was not competitive. It was lower than the market rate of interest at the time the bonds were sold. Issuing the bonds is a financing activity. We sold these bonds for cash and the cash we realized was the 420,000, the carrying value or base value minus the discount. So we show that it's a positive increases our cash when we sold those bonds. Last part, on December 31st, we amortized some of the discount. We had $51,750 in discount total at that time. We amortized a piece of it away. Amortization is one of the non-cash expenses that shows up on the income statement. when we use the indirect method, which is what we're using. It's a non-cash expense. It reduced our income, but did not affect our cash. And so we're going to add it back. And if you're unsure about that, I would one, one last time draw your attention to this guidance page in Blackboard. These are non-cash expenses, including amortization. And they need to be, I can barely see it here. And we need to be added back. They reduced our income, but they didn't affect our cash. And so we add that back. Okay, so at this point we have covered in bits and pieces all of the types of items that you would see on a cash flow statement. Operating activity section, investing activities, buying and selling plant assets, buying and selling financial assets, and then the financing section. Anything related to our own stock and the issuance and repayment of debt, the principal only. We have one more exercise to complete for this chapter. And that is exercise 10, where we are going to pull everything together and complete an entire cash flow statement from, from start to finish. Before we look at this, any questions, anything you want to talk about, ask about? So we already looked at at the beginning of class what the format looks like. We can see that we have our three line heading. We have the major sections, operating, investing, financing. You can see the operating section is much larger, has a lot more to it than the investing and financing section. 
The last part, and this is going to be the first time we do this, is reconciling the cash to what shows on the balance sheet. As we said on Tuesday, really the purpose of the cash flow statement is to show, to explain why our cash changed the way it did on our balance sheet. I could really fill this in already. Um, the cash balance at the beginning of the year, right here, the cash balance at the beginning of the year was $14. If it helps it feel more realistic, you can think of that as millions if you want. They keep the numbers small to make it easy for us so we don't have to punch so many numbers into our calculator. The cash at the end of the year was $183. So what happened? During the year, our cash increased, right? It increased from 14 to $183. It increased by $169 during the year. Everyone okay with that so far? Our job then in the body of the, of the statement between the operating, the investing and the financing activities is to explain where did this $169 come from? So when we add up the cash flows from our operating, investing and financing activities, it's going to total to $169, the change in our cash. If, it, if these two, three numbers here, here, and here, if those three numbers do not add, add up to $169, it's wrong, we've done something wrong. Because the whole purpose of this financial statement is to show where did that $169 come from? Everybody good so far? So we're using the indirect method. That's the only method you are responsible for for this class. Um, I, I should apologize. I had an email from, from one student um, after Tuesday's class that said there was a question on the pre-quiz about the direct method, I think. And I don't think everybody gets the same questions all the time on those pre-quizzes. I apologize if there was a question. I can't control that. I don't, I don't make those pre-quizzes. So there should not have been a question there. So if hopefully either you just looked in the appendix to find the answer to that, or you didn't need it to get to the 60% you need to, to get full credit for that quiz. But there, there should really should not have been something on there from the appendix. So we are using the indirect method. We are always using the indirect method. And that means we start with net income. So letter E in the following additional information says there was a credit to retained earnings for net income. That means an increase to retained earnings. That means it was a net income, not a net loss. So we're going to show that as a $62 net income. Again, if it was a net loss, we'd show it as a negative and that's certainly possible, although not preferred. Our next job then is to reconcile this net income of $62 to net cash flows from operating activities to identify the changes from the income statement and then from the balance sheet. So we start with the income statement. We're looking for gains or losses from investing activities and we're looking for non-cash expenses. So what are we told if we look right here, what happened to our accumulated depreciation during the year? It tells us there were no disposals. So that change from 42 to $68, a change of $26 in accumulated depreciation tells us we reported $26 worth of depreciation expense this period. That's the only reason, the only way that when we had no disposals that our accumulated depreciation changed. Everyone okay with that? Make sense? 
didn't tell us specifically what our depreciation expense was, but we can figure that out because we're looking at the accumulated depreciation and we can see what changed. It went up by $26. That reduced our net income, but did not impact our cash, so we add it back. Covered in the rules in Blackboard. Now, what else happened? Land was sold for $120, so let's look at that. What happened to our land account? It went from 330 down to 250. It went down by $80, but it tells us the land was sold for $120. So we only paid 80 for it. We only had it valued on our balance sheet at $80, but we sold it for $120. We must have had a gain of $40 on selling that land. Everyone agree? That gain increased our net income, but is not related to operating activities. So we need to subtract that out. Now, if you're looking at this right now and saying, well, I don't know how are we supposed to figure that out? I will just point out, this is the first time we're seeing this, but by the time we finish this cash flow statement, we will have looked at every single account on the balance sheet to see what happened to it and how did it impact our cash. So at this point, we've looked at the land account. We've looked at the accumulated depreciation account. Now there's something else I want to do with that land as long as we're here. We were told the land was sold for $120. Selling that land is an investing activity and it increased our cash. We sold it for $120. Since we just talked about that, we might as well put it in the investing section now rather than needing to come back to it later. So we've handled the non-cash expense on the income statement, the depreciation, and we've also removed that gain on selling the land. Now we're going to go to the operating accounts and see how they have changed. So we're looking for the reconciling items or the adjustments from the balance sheet. We've done the income statement. We're now looking at the balance sheet, the second part of our rules here, number four. Accounts receivable increased, we said this earlier in class, increased from 49 to 55. We had an increase in accounts receivable. That means we reported the revenue, but our customers haven't paid us yet. It's included in our income, but not in our cash. An increase in a current asset means that our cash is lower than net income would lead us to believe. And so we need to subtract that out. What happened to our inventories? Our inventories went up by $18, an increase in our inventories. Well, how do we make our inventory increase? We buy more inventory. We had to pay for it. Increase in a current asset means our cash is lower. We bought that inventory, but we haven't sold it yet. We haven't reported the expense, the cost of goods sold, but we spent the cash on it. Questions so far? The rest of our uh, assets are not current assets, are not operating accounts, land, equipment, and accumulated depreciation. So we're going down to the liability section. Accounts payable went from 37 to 51. It increased by $14. What does that mean? We owe our customer, sorry, our suppliers, we owe our suppliers $14 more than we did at the beginning of the year. That's an increase in our accounts payable. That means we held on to our cash. We didn't pay our bill. 
an increase in a current liability means that our cash is higher than our income would make us think. From a cash flow standpoint only, that's a good thing. We held on to our cash. We didn't pay our suppliers yet. It's good cash management until our suppliers say, hey, wait a minute, your bill's overdue, right? You wanna pay your bills on time, but there's no advantage to paying them early unless, as we talked about back in chapter five, which seems like a long time ago now, we talked about the offering of a discount for paying early. We always wanna take those when we have the option. But if the bill's due on the 20th, there's no advantage to us paying it on the 15th. We might as well hold on to our money unless they're giving us some kind of an incentive to pay early. Now I'm just adding down that column, starting with the net income. and adding and subtracting all of those reconciling items. And you can see for this company then, their net cash flows from operating activities is less than their net income. We suggested that's not what we want. It's not what we're looking for. We'd like that number to be higher so that the ratio of those two numbers is greater than one. Both numbers are positive though. So that's a good thing. Now we can move on to the investing activities. Everybody good so far? So for our investing activities, we've already addressed what happened with the land. We've already addressed what happened with the accumulated depreciation. Let's talk about the equipment account and then we will have talked about all of our assets. So what happened in the equipment account? It went from 175 to 205. We already know from letter C, there were no disposals of equipment during the year. Letter B tells us equipment was acquired for cash. So if our equipment went from 175 to 205, it increased by $30. That means we bought $30 worth of equipment that we paid for in cash. Cash paid for purchase of equipment. Because we used cash to buy that equipment, we're going to show it as a negative. It's a use of cash or a cash outflow. Now we can tell from our template that we don't have any other investing transactions. As you've heard me say in earlier situations, you know, in life, nobody hands you a template with just the right number of lines on it. So as we finish up this exercise, we're going to see that yes, we've talked about all the information we have. And then net those two things together, our investing activities contributed $90 toward our bottom line in terms of our cash, generated $90 in cash for us. Now, generally, that's not what we're looking for. For a company that's growing and investing in its future, we generally want, like to see the investing activities being negative, right? That we're buying more useful assets to run our business. But in this case, we actually sold more assets than we bought. That's okay. Let's see what else happened. Our dividends payable went from zero to $5. And in letter F, we're told there was a $24 debit to retained earnings for cash dividends declared. So we declared $24 in cash dividends but we haven't paid all of them because $5 of them are still sitting in dividends payable. So how many did we pay? 19. So we, we declared 24, we paid 19 and five still are in that dividends payable. So in the financing section, and I had to find, again, it doesn't matter which line we put it on. I just had to find the, the box that had the option I was looking for, cash paid for dividends. And the only reason they do that in our C now is because if they allowed you to do the same thing on both lines, it wouldn't know to mark it correct or not. So it gives us the correct answer in only one of those lines. But in reality, I could have easily put that on the top line of the financing section. 
cash paid for dividends, $19. We declared 24, but five of them are still unpaid. That's the dividends payable. We show it as a negative because we used cash to pay those dividends. Our next line is the common stock right there. The next two lines are our contributed capital. This company has only common stock, at least only common stock issued. They could have permission, I don't know, they could have permission to sell preferred stock, but we know they haven't issued any because it doesn't show up here. I'm looking at these lines combined as our contributed capital. So at the beginning of the year, the total was $150. That's the combined contributed capital at the beginning of the year. At the end of the year, it was $210 total, 125 plus 85. 210 at the end of the year, 150 at the beginning of the year. We're told in letter D, the common stock was issued for cash. So we sold $60 worth of common stock. Cash realized from sale of common stock, $60. The combined contributed capital went from 150 at the beginning of the year to 210 at the end of the year. That's an increase of 60. We show it as a positive. We received cash when we sold that stock. And so the net cash flow from financing activities, netting those two together, 60 minus 19 is $41. Again, I only know we're done because the template had all the lines we needed, but there's one other account that we haven't really looked at yet. And so I wanna talk about that just briefly because we need to make sure we have fully addressed what happened in the retained earnings. I'm just gonna put this on the screen so we can see what this would look like. So I want to put in T account, in the T account, what happened in our retained earnings during the year. So we can make sure that we've addressed everything. So at the beginning of the year, it had a $438 balance. We are told in letter F that there was a $24 credit. No, sorry. In letter E, there's a $62 credit to retained earnings for the net income. And in letter F, that's the debit for the dividends. And so those are the two transactions that we've already accounted for. The income of 62 is how we started the operating section. The dividends of 24 minus the dividends payable of five is how we calculated the cash dividends that were paid in the financing section. So let me just add up what we have here. 438 plus 62 minus 24 gives us an ending balance of 476. And that is what the balance sheet shows. So yes, we have already accounted for everything that happened in retained earnings. So I feel better about that now. We looked at, through the course of this cash flow statement, all of these accounts, all of these accounts, we know why every one of them changed and how it affected our cash. I've already done the reconciliation of cash at the bottom, but we need to check it and make sure it's right. So we need to add together the net cash flows from operating, from investing, and from financing. 38 plus 90 plus 41 is $169, which is what we said it needed to be. On the balance sheet, our cash changed by $169 and our job with the cash flow statements was to identify why and how it changed. And we did that. It works out, it matches. For this particular exercise, for this particular company, it was a net increase in cash. Certainly cash could also go down during any given time period. Any one of these numbers, 
net cash flows from operating, from investing, and from financing, any one of those numbers could have been negative. All three or just two or one could be negative. In this example, all three were positive, but that's not always the case. As I said, in the investing section, we're typically hoping, looking for that number to be negative because that indicates the company's investing in their future. They're buying new equipment or building new buildings or whatever it is they need to expand and grow and be successful in the future. To finish up this chapter, we just have two questions we have to answer. Was Olson Jones net cash flows from operating activities more or less than net income? And we already pointed out it was less. Net income was 62, their net cash flows were 38. It was less. Why was it less? Well, let's look at the big number here. $40 of the $62 they reported in income came from selling land. That gain from selling the land. So letter A. What else? Well, they reported $26 in depreciation, increase in accounts receivable, inventories and accounts payable. So let's see of these items here, which ones are true. So we had a gain on the sale of land. The purchase of equipment did not affect our operating section, nor did the sale of common stock. Purchase of equipment is investing and sale of common stock is financing. Changes in current assets and liabilities, yes, that affected our operating cash flows, as did depreciation expense. The dividends we paid is a financing activity, so that one would not be a source of our difference. So we're looking for A, B, and E. So all of those items, A through F, are things that showed up on the cash flow statement. But for this last question, it's just relating to the operating cash flows. Why are they different than our net income? With two minutes to spare, we finished chapter 13. Any questions, anything you want to talk about before I stop the recording? I've got a question um, for for the totals that had to be added up uh -huh. for the current operating assets and liabilities, we totally added up even though they were negatives. And then for the other ones, we like just disregard the negatives. No, so, were you, so I, I probably should be more careful in my language. When I say add them up, I mean, you're also, you're subtracting or adding the negative. So. You don't disregard the negatives anywhere. For this column, we did 20, or sorry, 62 plus 26 minus 40 minus 6 minus 18 plus 14. So we didn't disregard the negatives anywhere. If there's a negative, we're subtracting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I, I apologize. I probably used a, a misleading term there. Any other questions before we close the book on this chapter? All right, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you all for being here.